you guys see it now? Yes. All right. So I shared, I shared this slide during the first session, um, during the introduction. And I mentioned that our tool for molecular dynamics that we're gonna use today is gonna be Chimera. And I showed this figure here. And I told you that during that time that molecular dynamics is somewhat related to the typical equation that you will find in a physics book. Uh, force equals mass, mass times, times acceleration. So we're gonna understand today how this is connected with molecular dynamics uh, and why we're using this. If you remember from the reading, uh, there was, I think the second reading, it had this figure here and essentially it connects what we covered last week, molecular docking with molecular dynamics. So essentially what you can see here and hopefully it's readable uh, on your screen. Essentially, when you have your docking structure, uh, the, the docking has the facility of moving the substrate, of moving the ligand, but also the protein is, uh, is alive. Also the protein has movement. So, so that's not fully captured well with docking. And molecular dynamics is a tool that allows, that allows us to know how the protein is gonna react to that particular binding that we are doing with docking. So with docking, we have this, we have the scores. So essentially we already know based on the shape, as Gabriel mentioned, we're gonna have some uh, conformations that are gonna be able to, to bind because they don't fit on the cavity or the particular active site, but there will be some that they do. But after they bind, there are gonna be some rearrangements in the protein to try to get a better binding or try to respond to that particular, uh, that particular ligand that we have in your structure. And that's why we need molecular dynamics information to know what's gonna be the response of, of an enzyme to that ligand. So that's the connection with docking. And as I mentioned you and related to the, or, or name, enzymes dance. So enzymes are not a static picture. Enzymes don't look like the left the leg side and so it look more like the left like the right side they have movement they respond to the environment and this dynamics is going to have an impact later on on the activity that the enzyme is performing so that's why we really need to understand or try to try to have a guess of what's happening in our in, in our enzyme um, and also how it responds to the environment we really need to do or we really need to understand how our enzyme works how our enzyme dances so how the enzyme dances, it will gonna depend on, well, same as dancing is gonna depend on the type of music, gonna the time, depend on the mood. So the type of music can be kind of like the environment they are in. So if they're in a, in a very crazy environment, of course, it's gonna move more. Uh, if, if, the, if the, the enzyme doesn't feel good at, during, in that environment, of course, it's gonna move too much and so on. So it's gonna depend on a lot of the environment. And that's what we're trying to capture with molecular dynamics, the, that environment. So this is another figure from the readings, just to show here, here's a, a very clear example that, for example, we have a protein here with two different conformations. As you can see here with this zero representation, we're gonna have one conformation, the pink one is gonna be more open than the purple one. And with molecular dynamics, we're able to capture these motions. These motions are gonna be important because if you can imagine here, this is probably not the, doesn't capture that um, particular, uh, idea, the other part of the figure does it better. Of course, it, in, in the pink and conformation, you're gonna have a, a cavity that is bigger. So it's gonna be, uh, there's gonna be more room for the ligand to move. For the purple one, it's gonna be more constrained. And of course that will impact on how strong the binding occurs. That's something really, really cool that we can get uh, from molecular dynamics, essentially how the cavity is gonna change and how the, how, the docking, how the ligand is gonna respond to that, to those cavity changes. And here, let's try to contextualize where molecular dynamics fit into what it's called the big idea of molecular models. There are many different types of molecular models. So molecular dynamics is one of the most common ones and more popular ones, given the, uh, given the particular power that you can, you can have with it, the things that you can model. But also there are other methods that some of them are also derived from molecular dynamics or at least what it's called the 
in this case, we're going to do atomistic simulations. Literally, we're going to consider all the atoms of the proteins. But you can imagine that you can, you can reduce, for example, one uh, particular side chain. Instead of considering all the atoms, you can just consider as a, as a group of atoms. So if you go to the, to the right side here, instead of having an atomistic um, simulation, we're going to start having what it's called the concept of a coarse grain. Probably you want to take note of that concept for later on for the challenge. Coarse grain, coarse grain. We typically want to do coarse grain when we don't really want to have a resolution, uh, an atomistic resolution of what's happening with those atoms. Maybe because we, we don't really care what's happening, let's say, at the tail of our, of our enzyme, but we really care only about what's happening at, at the active site. So when we are not interested in into having all the details of what's happening in a particular uh, part of the enzyme, we can start doing applications of or, or start doing coarse graining. And essentially, you can see here that some regions of the protein can be just considered as, as big spheres. And that will save you a lot of computational time. This is what you will get if you essentially are starting to do coarse graining. So you are able to, since you are able to run for a longer time, your simulations is going to be less expensive computationally speaking. Your time scales that you can explore are going to be uh, longer. Also, the system you can model is going to be longer or bigger, uh, but it will require some information to make sure that those spheres are able to capture at least the essence of those particular uh, groups that we're considering. And atomistic simulations are a derivation of a more resolute molecular model called based on quantum mechanics. So you might have heard of the concept of quantum mechanics uh, that it's related to modern physics. So atomistic models, molecular dynamics, essentially is using classical dynamics, what is called classical physics. If you remember from physics classes, probably you have seen that there was classical physics from two centuries ago, and now we have modern physics with quantum mechanics. The reason we're using atomistic models and classical dynamics is because there's a way to parameterize, make some, essentially, you can grab the concepts, the simulations, the results that we get from water physics, from quantum mechanics, and describe them using classical uh, mechanics. So essentially, implicitly in our model, we are solving things that are uh, derived from, from ideas of modern physics. This is amazing. Like, uh, like this, this was a very smart concept that they did, like being able to capture what's really happening at a very, very atomistic level, very atomic level, like what, what it's happening in, with the concept of quantum mechanics and capture it with classical, classical physics. And as you might imagine, this concept of molecular dynamics got a Nobel Prize because it allowed us to do a lot of uh, or perform simulations that give us a really great explanation of what's happening in our systems at timescales that probably techniques like, for example, Gabriel mentioned NMR or, for example, crystal structures, they're not able to capture. That's, that's, the, that's the beauty and that's the power of molecular dynamics that we're able to get a resolution atomistically of what's happening. And those ideas are based and supported by concepts of, of, of modern physics. Um, so with that, does anyone have any questions at this point? Cool, I hope you're enjoying this. this is, I love this part. So as I mentioned before, atomistic models are based on approximate quantum mechanics results with classical functions and Newtonian dynamics. Newtonian dynamics. If you remember physics, Newton, force equals mass time acceleration. Here's where we are introducing the idea of, uh, of the formula that we showed before. And how do we introduce this? Through the concept of force field. You might have seen this figure from the reading. And what, what's happening in atomistic simulations when we are preparing or simulation for molecular dynamics, we need first to get a description of all of atoms in such a way that we can calculate things like energies and forces. So essentially here, each atom in, in the concept of force, in the concept of molecular dynamics, each atom is considered like being connected by string. So imagine just having something that uh, you can contract and extend. 
And also the angles are able, you can describe the angles in, in terms of uh, how open they are, how, how close they are essentially. And there are other like, like a proper dihedrals, so dihedral angles. And if you remember also from um, probably chemistry classes, there are some interactions that, are, that don't require covalent bonds, that no bonding interactions. So for example, when charges are, for example, the, the most uh, uh, clear example, positive and negative charge, they attract each other. And of, uh, there are ways to calculate the energy. So essentially in the force field, we get interactions or we capture the interactions that are related to covalent bonds, but also to non-covalent bonds or non-bonding interactions. So all this, is, it, all this is capturing the force field. How do they derive these particular uh, parameters? Like for example, here, case corresponds to some constants. What they do is they start to parameterize or they start to what is called benchmarking. So someone runs a quantum mechanical calculation, which is gonna be relatively expensive. And they try to fit that particular, those particular constants to those results to try to reproduce those. Or the other way, since we already have some experiments, so for example, if we're able to get some NMR measurements, we're able to start fitting our parameters to those NMR measurements. So either way can go. Can go. So if we have information about the system already for measurements, we can just fit our force field to reproduce what the measurement is giving us. If for some reason we don't have a measurement, then we can go to the concept of quantum mechanics and try to fit our parameters to those calculations that we're doing that are more expensive. So uh, one example, so a few examples of force fields. Forces is a zoo. Uh, so what, what, what I mean with this is that there are tons of force fields. Literally like you can even create your own force field if you want. And because of that, you're gonna see in the literature, if you start reading and entering more into molecular dynamics, you will start to see force fields like amber, charm, Bromos, OPLS, and there are many others that I don't include here, but they exist. And essentially, the reason there are a lot of force fields is because, of course, of course, each group tried to work on their force fields, and then uh, unfortunately they didn't talk too much between each other, and that's the reason we ended up with a lot of force fields. But also, the way they parameterize is different in some cases. So that's why the forces are typically not compatible with it, within each other. It's not that I can just grab, let's say one parameter from charm and three parameters from amber. So typically what you, when you're gonna run a simulation, you have to make sure that you have a force field that can capture or can uh, describe all the particular uh, entities that you have in your system. So essentially that you're able to reproduce the active site, you're able to reproduce the ligand and so on. So um, that's the concept of force field, and there are many. In Chimera, we're gonna use one based on amber. Um, so you're gonna, you're gonna see like, a little bit more later. And this is the slide that captures the overall idea of molecular dynamics. Essentially, you have here your structure in 2D, and you parameterize this based on what I mentioned, the, the concept of force field. And of course, this depends on if you want to get these parameters from experiments or from quantum mechanical calculations. Then you create your 3D structure uh, because we are simulating things that represent what is really happening in real life. So we, in real life, we don't have 2D structures. We have 3D structures. But also in real life, the structures or, or the 3D structures are not just in gas phase. They're not in vacuum. They have soap and they have water. Like if you think about it, like our body is water and all of enzymes uh, are essentially in our body. They are surrounded by water. So we are in molecular dynamics, we are also able to solvate to reproduce those interactions with the solvent. So as you can see here, the goal of molecular dynamics is to reproduce as close as possible the conditions where the enzyme, uh, where the enzyme uh, is located. And once we have this, with the solvent or without the solvent, it doesn't really matter, depending on the simulation. We are able to calculate based on the force field, some uh, initial coordinates, initial velocities that we can introduce to our, Newton, to our Newton equation. And 
if you're familiar with the concept of integrals and derivatives, you can see here that what we have is acceleration. If we derive acceleration twice, we get position. So that's how through doing the, the inverse of, der of derivatives, the concept of integration, if we integrate double, two times or uh, twice the concept, we can get positions. So essentially, once we get positions, that's what we get trajectories. If we have essentially how our structure is located at a particular time, we can start merging all the different positions and we're gonna have a trajectory, we're gonna have a movie. And that's essentially what we, what we are doing in molecular dynamics. We provide what's gonna be the time uh, for doing this integration. And the forces and velocities, they're calculated. And what we get at the end are positions. And those positions are essentially capturing what's happening in, in a dynamical system. And just to make a connection with another figure from the article, uh, it, it, you, you probably saw this one, it's initial atomic model. So essentially you, you start with your structure, you calculate forces uh, through the equation and you move each atom according to those forces. And since for, for example, you get this point, but to get a trajectory, you need to get all the other points. And that's why you advance the simulation time by one or two femtoseconds. For those that are not familiar with the concept of femtoseconds, is, uh, it's a very short time. It's, uh, it's 10 to the minus 15. So essentially, it's, uh, like you're able to capture movements very fast. So um, with that, that's a, the concept of molecular dynamics. Does anyone have any question of essentially the, the workflow or of the, the concept of what molecular dynamics is doing? We're good to go. Now, an important concept of molecular dynamics is, a conform is the concept of conformational sample, sampling or ensemble, uh, ensemble structure. Let's try to think about this particular simple system, something that is relatively small, um, close to uh, a peptide, not exactly a peptide, but something that is close to a peptide. And Perhaps some of you are familiar with the concept of Ramachandran plot. If not, this is a new word for you. Essentially, this is a plot that on one axis, you have one angle and on the other axis, you have another angle. And essentially you can describe all the different conformations of your system based on those two angles. And let's suppose that when you got your structure, your PDB file, Let's say you got your PDB file, whether for experiments or you drew it for with a software. And the confirmation that you got was probably number three. So you got number three. If you're under simulation for a very short time, since these other confirmations are really close between each other, as you can see here in this plot, you're going to be able to sample them. So you're going to be able to visit those confirmations with molecular dynamics. But perhaps something really cool happens in the confirmations four and two, or maybe in seven. And if we don't run the molecular dynamics for a long time, for a, uh, for a time that is reasonable, we won't be able to visit those particular confirmations. That's what is important with molecular dynamics. We don't run just for like, uh, let's say uh, two femtoseconds, 10 femtoseconds, 100 uh, femtoseconds. We run for a longer time because that allows us to do a conformational sampling that allows us to visit these conformations and at the end get a better description of what's gonna happen in our structure. So that's why in molecular dynamics, we tend to run for a long time in order to, if we start from structure tree, we can visit all these different conformations that they might play an important role in our, in our simulation, in our uh, interaction with the, with the, with the drug. Sometimes that, for example, maybe seven will, won't be, will be important. So it, it wouldn't matter if we don't visit the confirmation number seven, but that would depend on, we, would, we need to, to have a justification of why not to visit this particular uh, confirmation, for example. So yeah, that, that, that's, that's a concept of confirmation and sampling. And this is just a representation of the confirmations through a Ramachandran plot, essentially just describing the confirmations in terms of the angles 
And here is just describing the conformations in terms of energies. So what the conformation and sampling allow us to do is we create what is called a simulation ensemble. So it's, let's imagine that we superimpose all those conformations. We superimpose number three, number six, number four, number seven, and so on. And that uh, particular ensemble that we create, that, that overlapping all those structures, is going to give us a description relatively good of what someone who can get from, uh, for example, NMR measurement. So let's say if Gabriel goes to, goes to the lab and he's the expert in NMR, right? If Gabriel goes to the lab and he measures a particular protein, he can get the right side. And Gabriel can have a really good description of the protein at longer time scales. Uh, but sometimes what Gabriel is going to have is going to be some static pictures or things that, or particular, he's going to, she's not going to have a very, uh, uh, a real description or, or a description in very short time scales that might be important. Maybe Gabriel wants to know exactly how, uh, let's say, this particular loop moves. But NMR, since it has some limitations of time scales, he won't be able to see that. But now that we know molecular dynamics, we are able to provide uh, information to Gabriel of what's happening at particular uh, simulation times. And this allows us to describe in like, 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 like a video of what's happening time by time with our system. And this is amazing because we are just by doing some, like what we, what we consider like physics, uh, very basic physics from that like we cover in, in from elementary school or later on, that we can describe really cool things with instruments that uh, are, are, are fascinating and that describe what's happening in, in a real world. So yeah. This is amazing. Uh, when I when I was learning this, it, it was like I, I got impressed. Like, oh my God, you can describe experiments just with simulations. Uh, I, I mean, I, I'm passionate about describing things or what giving explanations. And molecular dynamics like gave me that that side of saying like, oh, I can describe what's happening in real life with proteins. Like, that's amazing. And now let's go to the concept of molecular dynamics workflow. If you read the literature, you will find probably three, five, seven, eight, nine steps, depending on the author. Each author, each person has their own the way to divide the steps. I like to separate them for simplicity to three, to make things clearer to follow. So let's separate the workflow in three. First, the system preparation, then what the true dynamics. So this here the system preparation is just preparing your system. There is like imagine you're gonna uh, prepare the scene to record uh, a video, a movie. You're preparing the scenography, everything. Then the dynamics is where you are really recording. You leave the, uh, you let the the the, uh, the people start to move or whatever you're recording to move, and that's what we are trying to uh, do in dynamics. And then of course analysis. The analysis after we have the video, after we have what's happening, then we analyze why that particular person did that, or why this, this particular object moved in that way, and, and so on. So let's go first to the system preparation. The system preparation, as I mentioned to you, is just to prepare all the conditions, all the scenography, to make the, make, the, make the movie happen. Essentially, what we prepare is the simulation box. And we, we do our simulations in, our, in a simulation box. The simulation box should be prepared in such a way that it captures the environment of our enzyme. And what's in our environment? As we mentioned before, we have our enzyme. If in our case, we're gonna have a ligand, we need to get that ligand also in our simulation. This particular, uh, uh, what is in blue, is gonna be the solvent and typically it's water because we are simulating uh, biological conditions. And as you might imagine, there are some amino acids that have some protein issue. They're gonna be in, in with positive charges. We need to make sure that our simulation is neutral. And that's why we add uh, ions. We add counter ions to neutralize our box. Sometimes we want to uh, represent like biological conditions like high concentration of salt or a particular concentration of, uh, of ions in our system. So we can start adding more ions to our, to our simulation. Depending on what we're going to simulate, it's going to depend, uh, that's going to dictate that's going to dictate how many 
ions you're going to add. Sometimes we don't add ions because uh, perhaps there are no, it's not relevant for a simulation. And sometimes we add a lot. And sometimes we don't, we don't add water. We add another solvent. It will strongly depend on what you're going to simulate. And so once you have your simulation box, you create your simulation box because if you remember uh, from probably uh, the third reading, if I remember correctly, you apply what it's called periodic boundary conditions. Uh, and essentially you have your simulation box, but that simulation box is uh, essentially reproduced in the software in the simulation several times. Why we're doing this, a, sim a simple way to consider it is like, imagine you have your box and you have a, a molecule, let's say water, that was really close to the border. And if I don't allow that water to leave the box, essentially that will be like adding an external force to the simulation. If someone like touches the border of something, it might just remember that if you touch something, it's gonna go back, right? And we're adding a force that doesn't represent something of our simulation or something of our system. That's why we do periodic boundary conditions to allow that water to leave that box, it doesn't matter that it leaves the box because it's gonna, a new one's gonna enter on the other side. That's the reason we do parallel boundary conditions in simple terms, to not adding external forces related to like poaching borders of our simulation box. So if we have a particle here that's gonna move, let's say a protein is moving here, and um, for a particular uh, time, it crosses this, part, uh, this border, it's gonna appear here on the other one. So don't worry, we don't have to worry about having a protein to move a, a lot around. Because that's what, that's what periodic boundary conditions allow, allow us, is to um, prevent adding external forces related to touching the borders and essentially uh, having, having the, those interactions. Um, any questions related to this? All right, very good. And an important concept here is that, of course, same as with docking, sometimes we don't have if, if, if our structure comes from docking, then we already have our system with hydrogens. If not, of course, you have to add, and to prepare your simulation box, you have to add those hydrogens. Just remember that concept uh, because it's going to be extremely important. And uh, then let's go to the dynamics workflow. This is the, the more technical one, the more technical section. And if you remember from the readings, there are several steps that you have to do. And also, if you remember the videos, there were like different tabs that you could start moving. The first one that you might have seen was energy minimization. We want to make sure, first of all, that if we added the hydrogens, those hydrogens are not like in positions that don't represent something feasible in, in nature. So imagine you have, you added a, a water, but we know that water has like the Mickey Mouse shape. We might let's imagine that we're a water that is very, very, very close to each other. It's not a Mickey Mouse shape, it's something like weird or something like a, a line that doesn't represent water. So with energy minimization, we're able to go from something that might be just like a, a, like a line to that angle shape. So that's the concept of energy minimization. That's the, that's the reason we do it is because we don't want to start with a geometry that it doesn't make any sense uh, uh, for, for things that in nature, that they, in nature, they don't occur that way. What, wh one way to visualize what animation is doing is ima imagine here in the, y -axis, in the y axis, we have energy and in the x axis, we have steps. We, we run the simulation for several steps. And what we will see, if we are able to keep track of the energy, we will see that it's gonna start decreasing. Once that we say that the energy decreases and reaches a plateau or like, a, let's say a, a straight line that is doesn't, doesn't vary too much on the y-axis, that's where we can say that we are have minimized our structure. We don't have to really go to a, a, a extremely flat line as, as long as we have a something uh, with substantial change of energy, then we're free to stop the energy minimization. So typically we run the energy minimization by, for, for let's say, Five, five, five thousand steps, ten thousand steps is is typically a short a short simulation. Then here comes the fun part, because energization we are not doing any anything interesting. Actually, this is this is done without temperature. We are just like we are just minimizing something with no temperature, with no pressure, just reducing the energy based on on those geometries, uh, just geometrical uh, constraints. 
Then here comes two steps and they call it uh, MVT, MPT. Those letters represent essentially what you're keeping constant in your simulation. So N means essentially the number of atoms. Of course, we, when we're doing a simulation, we don't want to suddenly remove an atom because that, that wouldn't make any sense. So that's what we want to keep the number of particles, the number of atoms. And first, we want, we want to keep the volume um, just to simplify our simulation to, um, but, but then we, of course, we can later, we later uh, modify the volume. And we, wanna, we're gonna have, we want to reach a point where the temperature is constant. So essentially, MVT, what it does is, if you remember, I mentioned here we don't have temperature. MVT is kind of like heating your system. Imagine you have something that is extremely cold. And then let's imagine you have a stove or something to heat, like a microwave. You put there your system and you start, you press the, the, the on button and you start heating your system. Essentially here, the, what it says is a short simulation to, to essentially relax to the temperature of interest. As you might imagine, the temperature that we typically pick is 25 Celsius. So something related to 298 Kelvin, 300 Kelvin. So that's the typical uh, room temperature uh, volume. And one way to know that this particular step was successful is to keep track of the temperature. We can see here the y-axis now is temperature. And here, now here's what we're, we're gonna start having in our x-axis uh, time scales or time. You will see here, you need to uh, start getting familiar with picoseconds because that will be, uh, or essentially the, um, the magnitude, the order of magnitude that we're gonna start seeing in simulations a lot, at least for molecular dynamics. So if you will see here, of course, the temperature is gonna fluctuate a little bit. It's not gonna be extreme. It's not gonna be perfectly 200, but you will see that essentially the value, it's it, on average, if we average all these values, it's gonna be something really close to 300. So that's the way we, we, we can analyze and just double check that our system has heated to the temperature that we really want. Then comes the other step, the MPT one. Now we don't have the volume as a constant. We have the pressure as a constant or something that we want to keep fixed or something like to keep a particular value. Here we are able to, or we are allowing our system to change the volume, but uh, we have temperature right now at 300. We have a temperature right now at 500 cent, uh, uh, degrees. Now we want to have also our system at atmospheric pressure. If you remember, atmospheric pressure is one atmosphere. So we, we want to have our system at one atmosphere. Unless we are running uh, probably an enzyme that represents something that is in very extreme conditions. Like for example, if you want to simulate the enzyme of a bacteria, that is the extremophiles, for example, that they are in conditions with a lot of temperature, like probably 800 Celsius and pressures extremely high. Of course, you won't do this value. You won't use 300 and what atmosphere. But if we are, if we are modeling uh, enzymes that are in our body or something that it's in normal conditions, then we're gonna pick values that add one atmosphere and 200. And we do this, we're able to, we, we allow the system to change the volume because if you remember, uh, volume is related to density. We want to make sure that our system is in a simulation with a proper density. So essentially, uh, in this case, it's a simulation in water. The density of water is gonna be around this particular value, uh, uh, 1,020. But of course, if you have a different solvent, sometimes you want to simulate something in, let's imagine, uh, like from a chemistry perspective, you want to simulate uh, a drug if it dissolves in alcohol or if it dissolves in acetone or something else, then you can, you can change your parameters to simulate that particular process. And of course, you, you're not gonna have a density of water, you're gonna have another density. And that's, that's how you can check if your simulation is performed properly, if, it's, if, if it has a equilibrium property, if you're able to see that, to check the density and it's close to what you are expecting. And this is the equilibration workflow. We're doing this, all these steps just to prepare our system in order to get what is called the production. We don't, I mean, we do this just to prepare our system, 
But when we are, when, so for, to do the analysis, that information comes completely from the production. This was only to get the right temperature and the right pressure. So that will give you also the right density. In the production ensemble, typically what you do is the same conditions as MPT, as the equilibration, you just extend it for more time. So let's say here, we're showing, we run this simulation for 100 picoseconds, just to equilibrate. But for the production, we were, we were gonna extend this time scale probably to 1000 picoseconds, or a, a bigger number, even reaching the microsecond time scale. So you can think of as a practical way to think, you can think of like production is just like an extension of this step just for a longer time. We're not changing something substantially unless we have a legal reason to do it. That's the general workflow. And uh, anyone has, does anyone have any questions of the dynamics workflow? All right. So then comes the third step, the analysis. And then the analysis, as I mentioned you, is analyzing the trajectory. So what you will see is literally having your movie and see how the protein and or drug moves over time. And that's where you can start seeing some interesting motions. Uh, here, for example, is just a, sh a short simulation time and we don't have any drug but you can imagine that you can see uh, the active site and you are able to see your duct uh, drop and see how it moves in the cavity and how also the amino acids around it and probably metals, who knows, are also gonna respond to those interactions with the, with the ligand. And one typical way that you might see, if you start reading more, more about this, you will see that people tend to report what is called the, the concept of RMSD. If you're familiar with, with some um, statistic concepts or like uh, if you have seen some statistics, this is RMSD means root mean square deviation. So it's, think of this as essentially comparing how different two structures are. So let's say we take a picture of yourself right now, literally we just uh, touch or screenshot bottom and we leave it like that. Then five seconds later, we take another screenshot. Probably our face is gonna be a little bit more rotated or probably our hands are gonna be in the same place. And if we compare those two, the way to compare it is through how different each position of all our pixels of our image are different. So essentially it's like in our case with proteins, we're not comparing the pixels, but we're comparing the coordinates. So let's say, uh, in, one, in, the, in the first picture, we have our atom here, and in the second one, we have our atom here. There was a displacement, and then through root mean square analysis, we can see or uh, check how much a protein moves over time. So here, for example, we can take as a reference the equilibrated system, which essentially is the one that you will get after this step. Or if you have a crystal structure, you can compare how much our system moves with respect to that crystal structure, to that PDB file. And typically you want to have in your simulation, in order to make, in order to have a simulation that it's reasonable, uh, is to have RMSDs that are as small as possible. Because you don't want to have a conformation that deviates a lot from the crystal structure, unless perhaps you want to get to find Conformations that are extremely interesting. For example, if you go to this particular plot, and let's say if you are sampling all this area, you will see that RMSD is going to be small. But perhaps you want to visit this number seven, and you will probably see in your plot that you're going to have some spikes and some RMSD values that are too high. When you're going to, when you see those RMSD values that they go up and down, and they stay steady for some time you can associate that particular um, behavior to getting new confirmations. So if you think about this, think about this RMSD, if you see a plot that first is kind of like steady for a particular value, then it goes up and stays there for a couple of, nan of picoseconds or nanoseconds and then goes down, we can relate that 
to essentially having first a confirmation, then we visited another one, and then we're going back probably to the, to the initial one or a new one. Who knows, who knows what, which one's gonna be? Based on the plot, it's hard to tell, but if we check the trajectories, it's gonna be easier to detect if we're having a, a, a different confirmation or not. Uh, any questions about this analysis? I uh, have a question here. Crystal can be a molecule that I have minimized energy or only PDB. Only the PDB file, because the, well, depending on, how, depending on how you minimize your structure. If you minimize your structure considering uh, temperature and all these different things, then you can use it. So for example, if you have a very, very nice uh, structure that you got from a simula another simula type of simulation, you can use it. But uh, typically, ideally, is, is comparing or making that comparison with respect to the, the crystal structure. Okay, so this is the analysis. And there are a lot of different things that you can analyze. Here I'm just showing the RMSD, but you can analyze distances, you can analyze how much the, the ligand um, moves. How, uh, for example, let's say there's a hydrogen bond between your active site and your, and, your, uh, and your drug. Maybe you wanna see how many times that hydrogen breaks. Maybe you want to see um, how, how close a particular amino acid is with respect to, let's say, an amine group of our, of our drug. So how many times we, we break non-bonding reactions, so these concepts of non-bonding reactions, or how far or, or, or charges uh, are at a particular time. So you can think about the analysis. There are a lot of different things that we can analyze. Here I'm showing the RMSD because this is the typical parameter that you check uh, for, for analysis to see if everything is fine. But for your particular goal, you will see that a chimera and in other different software, there are other things that you can get, other types of information that are gonna be extremely useful. So uh, this is analysis of trajectories, but if you remember from the, the readings, there are other things that MD can do, not only trajectories. In docking, we can have scoring values. So we can have those scoring values are somewhat related to how good the binding occurs to your active site. But sometimes it's better to have something more or something that we can really compare to measurements. And what we can compare is what is the concept of, what is called the concept of uh, free energy of binding. That's something that people can measure actually in, in the lab or measure uh, with experiments. So we are, instead of having someone and do the measurement, we can predict that binding energy. And we can do that through molecular dynamics. This is a workflow that shows how that works. Uh, essentially, uh, it's several simulations that you have to run. First, your, your enzyme and the ligand not binded or not docked, then the structure after docking, then doing some uh, different changes, um, like for example, turning off interactions or ignoring the solvent and so on. And then if you remember from uh, thermodynamic ideas, just by essentially starting to uh, having or subtracting and or having pluses and minuses of values of energy, we're able to predict what's gonna be your uh, free energy of binding. And that's how we can predict with molecular dynamics, how good or, or, or ligand is gonna be, or how good our drug is gonna essentially attach or bind to our enzyme. This is another example, but uh, you can think if you start exploring in molecular dynamics, it's gonna, it, can, it can also do other, other really, really cool stuff. But this is the one that might be more related and more relevant for drug design, just predicting binding energies. And now let's discuss a little bit about, about time scales because this is extremely important for macro dynamics. As I mentioned to you, first, we typically add for the integration concepts and so on, we are thinking about, we're talking about femtoseconds time scales. And I measure you is 10 to the minus 15. It's something extremely fast. The only thing that we're able to capture 
with just a couple of femtoseconds are vibrational motions of, for example, water. Water is not completely static. It has some like binding motion. So some motion like contracting a little bit and extending. We're able to capture that with the femtosecond time scale. But of course, for a protein, we don't really care too much about vibrations. We care a lot more about movements of loops, movements of, of amino acids, movement of cavities and so on. So we need to go to other timescales, uh, longer timescales. Now we let, for example, we have picoseconds. So as I've shown you here, some plots where in the picosecond timescale, picoseconds is 10 to the minus 12. Here we can have some information on rotations. It's starting to become more, more important, more relevant. Rotation, though that's gonna be important because maybe your uh, drug can have some rotation and that will be good to capture it. But rotations are still lacking resolution or description of protein structures. Like for example, helicopters. If we want to have helicopters, we need to start increasing our time scale. So going to the nanosecond time scale or even the microsecond time scale. Uh, so um, all the things that are around this time scale are hairpin folds, loop dynamics, if our loop is gonna move or uh, do some interesting movement and doing docking in real time, for example, literally instead of starting with our dock structure, we can start with our, our drug separated from, from, the, from the active site and model essentially how our drug is gonna start exploring the surface or, or, or the active site and then bind. We can also do that. Uh, but of course, you can imagine that that's gonna take a longer simulation time. So with talking, we're kind of like making a trick of saving some time of preventing to simulate all that process of how the structure binds. And we start probably just, we start already with the dog structure. But in, perhaps we don't want to have that uh, as a starting condition, then we can simulate that, that dynamical process. And an important concept, not actually not speaking related to drug design, but as uh, people read into biological fields, protein folding, this is an amazing concept. And uh, it will be extremely great, uh, like fantastic to simulate protein folding. But one of the current limitations right now, um, just besides perhaps the force fields might not be able to capture these dynamics is that in order to get protein folding, we need to go to time scales of seconds. And for a computer, at least for the computational research that we have nowadays, reaching second time scales is extremely hard. Literally, we can just, if we start running a simulation time here and we wanna run for seconds, we, wanna, we might probably wait for even years. It's really hard. I mean, it's really hard to reach those time scales. So that's why we typically limit ourselves, not because we don't want to explore these time scales, but, but because we don't have the resources to do that, to explore nanosecond, microsecond time scales. But if you remember from the first slide or second, third one, if we use the concept of course grading, that's how we can start exploring those time scales. So essentially, we want to explore things on the above the microsecond time scale. We can start using the concept of course grading. So it won't be an atomistic simulation as we were covering here but still we'll be able to get some information of dynamical processes at that time scale. And just to ex explain what this means, there are a lot of tricks to uh, see these particular motions without literally uh, waiting for a long time uh, to see this phenomenon. So there are techniques that people have developed that it's called enhanced sampling methods, enhanced sampling MD simulations, where you make some tricks to make your simulations or make, make your simulations to happen faster without losing the true dynamical or the true trajectories that we have. And one typical example, let's think about is if, if we think about energy, energy is related to temperature. So if we have a temperature of 300 Kelvin or 25 Celsius, most of the 
uh, the dynamics going to happen on this on this particular uh, confirmations. What if we run our simulation, let's say not at 300 but at 600 at 600, at 600 Kelvin? Perhaps it's not the condition of our enzyme, but if we have a really good reason, a very good justification to do that, it, we will be able to reach confirm, the confirmation number seven faster. That's a simple trick that people sometimes do. They increase the simulate, they, they increase the simulation temperature in order to have the dynamic process to occur faster. So when we have a temperature higher, things move faster. And in principle, we can have, we can form more confirmation and sampling faster. Other tricks that are really cool and they're related to what we discussed before, you can do or develop force fields or trajectories employing machine learning. Literally, you can parameterize force fields in such a way that they're able to move your structures faster and also capturing those uh, motions. So people, an active, an active field of research right now is using machine learning concepts to generate force fields that allow you to do enhanced sampling. So maybe in the future with these machine learning algorithms, we will be able to do this or do simulations at the atomistic level without doing coarse grain at really long time scales. This is fantastic. This is amazing. Like literally, like the power of what people are doing with machine learning is fantastic. And we can see here that it has a lot of applications, not only for what we'll typically see, like face recognition, like um, uh, having autonomous cars. In science, you can also use machine learning. And here's one uh, an example that I mentioned to you. But well, you can imagine that there will be other types of examples. If you start exploring in drug design, there are going to be tons of different applications of machine learning. So um, it's, it's really cool to have some notion of, of what, what it is and how we might see uh, those applications in the future. Any questions about timescales or in general of what we comment? Uh, we commented in the past few minutes. Denaturation, yes, you can in principle study denaturation. That's, uh, that would be really cool to do. But of course, for denaturation, we will have to reach really long time scales. So it will, it will be a little bit hard, but maybe we can do denaturation simulations based on temperature. Maybe your protein is gonna denature at 400 Kelvin. In principle, we, we will be able to do that. But we have to make sure, or, or something that we have to keep present is that denaturation, well, we're gonna break non bond interactions. Molecular dynamics is not able to model things that involve breaking covalent bonds. That's one of the current limitations right now. But you can think of um, you can think of combining if you really want to simulate things where bonds break, you can think of combining a particular section with a quantum mechanical description and then the rest of your system with molecular dynamics. So if we have a section that we can model with quantum, mechanic, quantum mechanical methods, that it's gonna be able to describe uh, bond breaking. And that will also be able to describe for example, if we have a metal, maybe there are some enzymes that when you bind a drug, when you bind something, they change the oxidation state. So for example, iron, we have iron, we have mag magnesium, manganese, etc. Sometimes when you bind something, the charge changes. With a typical force field, we are not able to capture that. But if we combine it with quantum mechanical methods, we are able to describe uh, those processes, those oxidation changes of our metal and many other things that require more like changes. But that of course depends a lot of the type of simulation, the type of drug, the type of interaction that your drug does to the enzyme. Um, yeah, Gabriel answered the other question. If computer simulations will replace lab experiments. Uh, yeah, <laughs> we, we, uh, it's gonna be extremely hard for that to happen. I mean, of course, it's gonna, of course, uh, molecular simulations is gonna give you very accurate descriptions that you can later corroborate. 
but but of course experiments are what's happening in real life and sometimes the simulation if we don't run experiments we will never know if our simulation is right or wrong we need to corroborate somehow with experiments and there are other things of simulations that probably there are things that happen is in in real life and simulations not for example if you are simulating a membrane it's going to be really hard to capture all the things that are happening in the membrane that in experiments you can do and how accurate is ND? It's extremely accurate. And that's the reason that a lot of people spent several, several years, uh, months of research, uh, of research time developing the forces. Because they're, they want to make sure that the force field really captures what the experiment is going to give you. So they're extremely accurate. What you, what you measure or, or what you get from a force from, from a molecular dynamic simulation, it's gonna be very accurate, unless the force field is bad. So you have to you have to be sure when you start a simulation that the force field is able to describe their system properly. So yeah, Gabriel, uh, answer already that question. So yeah, I mean, that's uh, any other question? Because th that's essentially the last part of the theoretical. Um, section. I know we spent a lot of time, but hopefully it was clear what all my, what molecular dynamics can do. And if you remember from the videos, uh, molecular dynamics, at least the activities uh, and chimera, is going to be relatively fast. So uh, I, I think we should, we will have time to do all that stuff. Um, just for you that want to get deeper into the concept of molecular dynamics, uh, today we're gonna use Chimera, but as you will see, or if, if you saw in the videos and if you have explored a little bit, Chimera, it's a little bit, it has some limitations. There are a lot of things that you can't change. So as an, for introduction, for introducing the concept and see how we prepare and how the work flows, Chimera is perfect. But you might imagine that um, it's gonna, it, it will have some limitations because there are different enough things that we can change. So for example, Chimera, we can change the force field or there are, it, ha, it only have some several force fields, but maybe you want to use a new one and Chimera doesn't have that option. There are other software that I know some of you are gonna start working uh, also for thesis project related to molecular dynamics. You might have used other software like NAMD, NAMD, uh, Amber is not only a force field, Amber is also a software. Is not the same for Amber Force Field as Amber Software. Grow Max, or maybe eventually you will work with something that involves solids. We can also do raw molecular dynamics for solids or some semiconductor things, or some interfaces of, uh, for example, biosensors. When you have uh, a, a part that is a semiconductor with a part, another part that is an enzyme, we, we may be able to do that, those type of simulations with software that lamp, for example, lamps. But there are many others. And if you are, if for, so for some reason, uh, you have to work with some of this software and you want to have some introduction to the software, I will be happy to help you with that. In the past, I have used NAMD and Gromax. So if you have you ever worked with this software and you have any questions, feel free to ask. And I will be happy to give you an, an introduction and explanation of how you run things in NAMD or Gromax. Because one of the really hard things in microdynamics, as you can see here, the concept of microdynamics, we can summarize it in one slide. This is the workflow. But unfortunately, when people were developing all this software, they developed in the way they wanted. So, so some things that you have to do for NAMD, for example, are gonna be different in Gromax. Some files that you're gonna use for NAMD, they don't exist in Gromax because they, for example, in NAMD, you use two files. In Gromax, you use one file, and so on. The workflow is the same, but the preparation for simulations is different. So something that happened to me and, and a lot of people is that the learning curve for the MD concepts, OK, it takes some time, but once you have it, it's uh, is general for everything. But using the software and learning the software it takes some time because each software was different. So I remember when I was learning uh, NAMD, it took me some time. Then for some reason, I didn't, I, I couldn't use NAMD for what I wanted to do because Gromax has another method implemented. I had to learn Gromax. 
it was a bit painful because everything that I knew from Nandi, it was useless. And uh, at least from the from the preparing the files, right? Because the concepts are the same. So the learning curve was a bit steep, but I mean, if you ever have to work with all this particular software, feel free to ask me and I'll be happy to introduce you to the concept, the workflow, how I run the things. Uh, as you might imagine, molecular dynamic simulations are expensive. And what people typically do, and I can show you if, if we have time, how we essentially connect ourselves to computers, to supercomputers that they have tons of different CPUs, for example, or CPUs typical or computers or laptops, personal computers, they typically have like probably four, six, eight CPUs, probably 12, 16 at most, most of them. But supercomputers might have 200, 300, 500, and so on. So that's why we typically, we, we typically don't run molecular dynamics simulations in our computer. We typically use supercomputers. And in order to, do, to use supercomputers, we need to um, uh, learn how to interact with, uh, to connect with our supercomputers. And that's where we use commands uh, related to, for example, my, my familiar to some of you, uh, Slurm commands, uh, Linux commands, bash, and so on. So if you are, if, or if at some point you're, you need to run molecular dynamics simulations and you need to learn also how to interact with these tools, I'll be really happy to, to help you with learning how everything works, uh, or at least how to make connections or how to connect to supercomputers. Where's the most powerful supercomputer? Okay, let me, let me ask for the first one. It was not- oh, Hold on, I have, I have a question. First, first Victor Acuna asked, uh, why sometimes you use certain force, force fields instead of others? If, if all the force fields uh, use uh, Newton's laws to describe them. Uh, that's, a, that's a fantastic question. All force fields are, use Newton's law, that's true. But some, some force fields, they change the way they calculate the normal interactions. So it's not always the same formula. Some forces have some slightly changes on the way they calculate. Although they all calculate the energy, the way they calculate it is different. So that's why forces are different because they decided that for their purposes, it was, it was better to calculate the normal interactions in one way than the other. But in general, as you can see, all of the forces, depending on the expression, depending on what the expression is, you will get energy. So it doesn't matter how they calculate it because at the end, we're gonna have the same value or, or the same uh, concept of energy, the same, the same uh, particular uh, 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 parameter. What was the other question, Gabriel? Uh, uh, can you hear me? Yeah. So something just uh, funny is that when I, I did a study in the University of Tennessee, and there, there is a famous lab in the in the United States. You have national labs, and it is one of them is called Oak Ridge National Lab, and it is where they develop this uh, nuclear bomb, atomic bomb. So it was a secret city for forty or fifty years, and all the time because we have connection with the University of Tennessee, you used to hear about talking about Titan, the faster computer, the faster computer in the world, and you will see in the news every year, you every every superpower country is trying to come up with the faster computer. And then you, the next year you used to hear the Chinese came up with the faster computer and then the, you, the Germans or the Japan. And that was something cool because uh, Jesus was talking about how much computer power you need to make all these calculations. And the more accurate, the better or more uh, information that you're gonna get. So that's something funny. Anyway. Right. So yeah, that, that, that's related to the question. Where is the most powerful computer? I'm not sure if Titan is still the the, the still yeah. the most powerful one. All, Perhaps, all, yeah. the time, all the time is changing, yeah. But yeah, typically, typically, like yeah, it changes by year because they they try to you know be always at the top. Um, so I know Titan is one of the most powerful ones. There's an extremely powerful one in um, in uh, in Carnegie Mellon, for example. Carnegie Mellon is an university in the U.S. in Pittsburgh. It's also a, a very powerful supercomputer. Uh, there's also UK one, I, I forgot where exactly, but it's extremely powerful. Also China has their own uh, powerful supercomputer. Russia has their own powerful supercomputer and so on. 
Um, so yeah, um, every year changes. And one thing of debate right now, and for those that are uh, really into science and learning uh, or reading like news, if you have care of the concept of the quantum computer, which who knows is gonna be a rally or not, they try to use quantum computers eventually for these extremely uh, heavy calculations. So who knows, maybe in the, if quantum computing works in the future, maybe we'll be able to run things in quantum computers and have time scale extremely long, who knows? And then we have another question. Is there a unique force field in docking or the force field that apply uh, can keep different for each molecule? If I understand the question is if, if it's the same force field for like the concept of docking than for protein and ligand separated or um, So, okay, so docking, the way docking works, uh, so here, here docking, we're not using the scoring concept. But for example, if you want to model uh, your ligand and the protein, it's the same force field. So it's the same family of force field. So you will see that the force field is gonna have some parameters to describe amino acids, proteins, but at the same time, it's gonna have parameters to describe uh, what it's called ligands in, in, in the vocabulary of forces. But it's, it's the same family. They are compatible with each other. They have the same form, the same expression. So essentially the way they describe this uh, bonded and open interactions is gonna be the same. Does that answer the question? All right. Yeah, so once you pick the force field, essentially it's kind of like, that's, that's, the, that's the part where you need to spend a little bit of time analyzing if the force field is able to describe properly your protein and your ligand. If for some reason you don't have, you have a force field that describes perfectly the ligand, but not a protein or not um, at the active site, then probably you need to do something else uh, or parameterize your own force field. You, you will see, it, it will depend on the case. But yeah, you should be able to, or you have to make sure that you pick the same force for everything. It, it, it's still not right now possible to combine forces of different families. So let's say it's, you're, it's not possible to use um, charm for the ligand and amber for this one or vice versa. It's not possible nowadays. Um, so yeah. That will be uh, all for today. Then let's go to the activity.